I came across the story in 1977 in this reprint done in England. I'm going to tell you a short praise of this story because it's going to probably answer a number of things for you eventually. In the story that Raymond wrote, Noise Level, there's a meeting called in the Pentagon. The chiefs of staff all come to the meeting and there's a president's representative there and there's this big table. In the middle of the table there's this plastic wrapped bunch of burned junk. And it was sealed up airtight, you know, tied off anyway. And the president's aide tells the assembled scientists and professors who have been called in from all the United States and the, and the generals, he said, look, I know you're not going to believe what we're about to tell you, but something extraordinary happened last week and we need your help to solve the mystery. He said, we have some of it on film. We were testing this young fellow's device. Um, he's kind of a smart aleck, uh, but uh, we were testing it last week with him and here's the film we took. And so they open up the curtain and the film starts. And you see this young, kind of red-haired, freckle-faced scientist looking smart aleck, you know, really a bright genius type. And he's got this little chest pack and a backpack and a little belt, and he's standing in front of some of the generals there in, in a football stadium. And he reaches down, he pushes a button, and he lifts up off the deck two or three feet and just stands there in the air. Nobody says a word in the office there in the Pentagon. They're thinking, wow, okay, so he's been lifted up a bit. Then he pushes another button and he rotates sideways and lifts up about 40 <coughs> feet and takes off, whew, flies around the football field and comes back around for a low pass over the generals. Everybody ducks and whew, there's a puff of smoke. Quick explosion, whew, he nose dives into the deck and dies, a ball of flame. The package on the table holds the remains of the guy's instrument, what's well, left after the fire melted everything together. He said, gentlemen, he died before he told us how he did it. This guy doesn't work for any government. He's just an individual. He doesn't have any university grants. He's just an individual, and he did this. Now, you've got to figure out how he did it. We've got his apartment. We've got his library. We've got his lab. We've got everything. You go and take his notes apart and figure out how he did this. Well, wow. Well, everybody runs over a big gaggle to this guy's apartment. They look through his library. He's got chemistry here, physics here, philosophy, uh, ancient mysticism, uh, everything and he's got a lathe room and, and, and downstairs in the second floor area here and then he's got over here he's got uh, biochemistry and all kinds of stuff and they said could one guy have read all of this and they start looking through some of the volumes and there's notes and annotations in the margins well where are his other notes couldn't find him weeks and months passed as they puzzled over how he did it and groups all over the United States for like Martin Marriott and some of the other larger corporations had scientists gathered together trying to figure out how did he do it. One guy was out fishing, one of the scientists, and he's throwing his line into the water. And as it hit, ripples went out and there was this swirling vortex next to a rock. And he saw how the splashing water moved some twigs that came together, pulled in by the vortex and stuck together. He says, I've got it. I understand gravity now. They went running back, and a month later, they rang the guys at the Pentagon and said, we've done it. It's 30 feet in diameter, and it's about a foot thick, and it weighs 15 tons, and it only moves off the floor an inch, but we've got anti-gravity. Well, the Pentagon said, get your notes, get over here quick. Everybody is reassembled into the Pentagon to the same room. They show the film of the test to all the other guys who weren't there, and they say, wow, fantastic. The guy that called the meeting said, gentlemen, I want you to meet someone very special. Curtain opens and out comes the red-headed scientist, the dead one. And they said, what is this? They said, well, he's an actor. He never existed as we told it to you. We had to remove the noise level from your mind to say that it is possible to get you to work on it. <laughs> now, I tell you this for a reason. Two streams of events have been following the UFO circumstance, the real alien or fallen ones strain, chain, and the one where the noise level has been removed in certain scientists' minds to get them to develop this. We have developed anti-gravity. I was recruited way after they got it the first time because I came up with a method of um, powering a saucer craft using an ionized air plasma, which I'll explain to you later. In that program, under Dr. Teller, I was sent down to Australia. And so I have been privy to things you would never see. You would never, ever see. And I'm going to show you some of those things as best I could re recreate them today. 
so that you'll understand that mankind has, on his own accord, done some of this. Now, before the alien card was played or begun in 1947, it was kicked around in Washington that, in addition to removing the noise level, after World War II was over, there was going to have to be some sort of a plan devised to stop warfare. We could not afford, the human race could not afford another warfare with the technology of the stage it was. Any of you that have brothers and sisters, as children you can remember when you were in your room fighting, at night probably, and your dad said, stop, or I'm coming in with the belt. <laughs> That he meant business, yeah, probably, until you heard the knock at the door. And when the door ripped open and there was the eight-foot-wide belt with meat cleavers on it and said, I'm going to kill you, you knew you, you were friends again. You and your brother or sister were friends. And, ah, hey, Dad, no problem. We are that way. Russian, Chinese, American, Canadian. We are the fighting siblings, all humans. Well, majority of us anyway. <laughs> To get us together long enough to try peace, to get along in harmony, it was reason that they could not coerce us from any philosophical or political point. They could not force us with a dictatorship. So they were going to fool us into thinking we were being invaded without knowing that we had aliens at the time. The best laid plans go astray. In 1947, there was a crash. And there were alien beings on that crash. Even though I wasn't there, I'm convinced from what I was shown inside the organization. Certainly there were some technologies, and probably still are some remaining, that we were not able to back engineer. But some very interesting things did surface. Noise level. I mean, yeah, we don't want that. Okay. Now, to help you understand gravity, I'm doing this for a reason. There have been people that have talked about anti-gravity, some magic thing and this kind of stuff, and it's a very simple thing in concept. But I'm going to use graphics and some animations and some films of some of the tests we've done to explain gravity to you. So you understand then how anti-gravity can be made and was made, and will not be surprised when you see this upon you shortly out in the open there is a real severe deception in the works, not entirely mankind's doing. Remember me telling you about noise level, guy out fishing and seeing the vortex and the little spin and stuff. What we see here is just a simple water drop. But I've put this up to show you how when the water drops, it splashes out, makes a large radius first ring, then smaller ones, smaller ones out like that. And then the reflection of its splash pops up a ball in the air like that. Okay, big deal, you've seen that. Now, what happens next is you will see if you take one splash, it sets equally, almost equally spaced crowns out like this. These are inertial things formed by water pressing on itself to make little beadlets out here like one single drop would do. This happens usually on a flat surface instead of a deep amount of water. Now, for the astronomers in the crowd. What we see here is a splash which can represent the sun. Then there's the first orbit of some planet, and the second and the third. But if you're an astronomer, you notice that those rings, the radii of them, do not match our planets. You think, well, this couldn't be explaining gravity and orbits of planets. But it does. Because in space, you don't have an infinite pond where the ripples just go out and don't come back. Space has mass and resistance. It's like a very fine fluid that's so fine that atoms are made up of a lot of it. It's called ether space in James Clerk Maxwell's day last, or century before last, and we have returned to that understanding of the way the world works. When you take a bucket of paint, thick paint, and you put your paint stirrer on your drill and you stick it down in and spin it around, it will make circular waves go out and hit the edge of the paint bucket and then come back to your spinning paint stirrer, to the little rod. 